Chapter 14 The winter proved to be even colder and stormier than the year before. On one occasion, Alan was stuck inside the cabin for a full week because of a blizzard. Almost every time he went outside, he had to dig his way through the snow tunnel. He thought of making a covering of some kind for the trench, a makeshift roof, but decided against it. The snow in the tunnel helped to keep the cabin warm. The extra warmth was well worth the digging it took whenever he wanted to go outside. As the Arctic night wore on, Alan realized that this would have to be his last winter on the Ann Forbes. For one thing, he was running low on coal. He still had a dozen bucketfuls on the peak of the iceberg, but he wanted to save those in case something happened to the Ann Forbes. He could always burn the timbers of the ship itself if he had to. Although it was hard work to hack at the tough oak with his hatchet, he would do it if it became necessary. But that would actually be burning his house, only to be tried if all else failed. One day, or rather night, since the sun had not yet put in an appearance, Alan climbed his ice peak and saw, on the southern horizon, a fan-shaped patch of sky colored red and gold. Although the sun was still hidden, Alan knew that it would not be long until daylight returned once more to the Arctic. The light would last a little longer each day until early May, when the sun would not set at all. Then there would be no darkness, but twenty-four hours of daylight every day. Whistling, Alan went back to the Ann Forbes and began to make ready. The next day the rim of the sun appeared, a very bright red edge peeking up over the horizon. Some weeks later the sun had climbed high enough into the sky to provide a couple of hours of daylight every day. By the end of March, Alan was ready to leave the Ann Forbes. He had already spent days filling the cave on his ice peak with frozen whale meat, with extra clothing, with shavings and coal for a fire. Almost everything he did not intend to take with him he brought to his summer home on the Iceberg Peak. He was afraid that the Ann Forbes might disappear, crushed beneath the leading edge of another ice field, or sunk in the freezing water because the ledge she was resting on had broken off. Alan had no intention of returning to his ice island, but if another misfortune occurred, another meeting with polar bears or an open channel of water that he could not cross, he wanted to be able to come back and be sure that he could survive through the summer on the iceberg. There would still be the chance of a whaling ship spotting his signal flag, or the berg might come close enough to land that his raft could ferry him across. One thing he was sure of, he had no intention of spending a third winter on the iceberg. And so, a few hours before sunrise one morning, Alan was outside blocking the entrance to the Ann Forbes with chunks of ice. He spent an hour filling in the entrance tunnel so that wild animals, especially bears, would not be able to break in. Then he got into his two knapsacks, one on his chest and one on his back. Calling Nancy, he strapped her into her knapsack and put the collar around her neck. Well, are we ready? he asked. Nancy reared up on her hind legs, ready to go for a Sunday stroll. Say goodbye to our home, Alan ordered. He picked up his fowling piece, took a long last look at the rounded hump of the Ann Forbes, then turned his back on the ship and looked off to the east, where a light patch in the sky showed that the sun would soon be rising. Then he and Nancy left the iceberg for the bleak and empty ice fields that surrounded them. Using the sun when it was visible, Alan set a course west by southwest. If he were in Baffin Bay or Davis Strait, he knew land lay in that direction. Even if he were on the other side of Greenland, somewhere off the eastern coast, such a course would take him to the mainland instead of out into the open ocean. He set the course mainly to the south because he had no way, other than guessing direction from the position of the sun, to determine the exact points of the compass. And if he were going to make any mistakes in direction, he wanted those mistakes to lead him to the south. He had had enough of the north. 
Alan was prepared to travel for days, perhaps even weeks, before he met anyone. After twelve hours of steady marching, he made a brief camp in a sheltered spot on the windward side of an upthrust ridge of ice. Here he took some meat and a couple of biscuits out of his pack. He also took out a piece of whale blubber for Nancy, which the animal swiftly gulped down. With the meat, biscuits, and dried fish in his pack, Alan figured he had enough food to survive at least two weeks. Nancy's pack contained about 50 pounds of whale blubber, which he knew would only last her a couple of days. After that, he would count on her catching fish if they came to any open water, or perhaps a careless young seal out on the ice. At least both of them had started out in good shape. For the past month, Alan had been fattening himself and Nancy as much as possible ahead of time. Then if they ran short of food, they could, like the Eskimos, live off their body fat for a while. Alan had already traveled through the three hours or so of daylight, but fortunately it was a clear night and the star shine provided plenty of visibility. He rested behind a hummock of ice for half an hour or so until he felt his limbs beginning to stiffen with the cold. Then he got to his feet and resumed the march. Two hours later he spotted half a dozen white dog-like animals in the distance. They seemed to be circling something on the ground. Alan halted and tied the leash to Nancy's collar. If they were wolves, he wanted no part of them. He waited, trying to make up his mind what to do. Even if the animals had killed something and he managed to scare them away from the carcass, he had no need of more meat. Both his packs were still full. As his route would pass close to the animals, Alan decided to keep a sharp eye on the scene as he went by. Cautiously he advanced and had not gone very far when one of the animals spotted him and gave a whinnying bark. The others stopped eating and raised their heads. By now Alan recognized them as the most common scavengers to be found in the polar wastes, white arctic foxes. No longer afraid. He released Nancy from the leash and marched boldly ahead. Nancy scampered over the ice to the foxes and the animals scattered. She began to paw at the ice and whimper. The foxes, a safe distance away, sat down and watched her. Now and again one would lift his head and give an angry bark. Nancy, come back! Here, girl, come back! Alan called. But Nancy ignored him, something she hardly ever did. Alan had no intention of going out of his way to discover what had attracted the foxes. Probably they had found the remains of a dead seabird. As far as he could tell, there wasn't even the carcass of an animal there. He needed to save his strength for the rest of the march. It wasn't very sensible to make unnecessary detours. He called Nancy again, and again she refused to come, but instead sat down and whimpered. For a moment he was tempted to march on and trust that she would eventually follow him. Finally, though, he remembered the last time they had marched out, when Nancy found the tracks of men and dogs. He had better hike over and see what was keeping her. When he reached the spot, he could hardly believe his eyes. In that vast immensity of ice and cold, of empty horizons, Nancy had managed to find the tracks of men and dogs and sleds. He let out a great shout, then threw his arms around Nancy and kissed her cold black nose. Once more his pet had saved him. When he could think calmly again, Alan noticed all the blood surrounding a plate-sized hole in the ice. The three or four men had obviously killed a seal, then taken the dead animal along with them. The scent of blood had attracted the foxes, though why the scavenger still hung around he had no idea. Except for some bloodstains, there wasn't a shred of the seal to be found. The hunters had obviously thrown the whole animal onto their sled and made off with it. After a slow and careful examination of the tracks, Alan decided that there was only one sled and three or four hunters, and six to eight dogs. With a light heart, Alan began to follow the, the sled tracks. He had not gone far when he noticed that the foxes had returned to the scene of the killing. Curious, he watched them, 
They were eating the reddened snow and licking the blood-stained ice to take advantage of every last drop of nourishing blood that had been spilled. At the rate they were going, the foxes would have the place cleaned up in no time. Alan realized then that had he come by a half hour later, the foxes would have already licked up all the evidence and be gone. He could have passed within a few yards of the tracks and never noticed anything out of the ordinary. Unlike the time he had tried to follow his own tracks back to the Ann Forbes, Alan was able to pick out the trail without any difficulty. The hunting party left plenty of evidence, and at one spot he could tell they had stopped for a while be because their sled had overturned. But after an hour on the trail, Alan was forced to halt and make a decision. The wind was springing up, cutting visibility down to a few yards and blowing snow over the tracks he was trying to follow. If the wind got much worse, there was a good chance that he would lose the trail. It was therefore important to overtake the hunting party before the wind increased or the weather changed, bringing a fresh fall of snow. Alan was carrying close to a hundred pounds of food and supplies. He guessed, from the freshness of the seal blood, that the hunters had a couple of hours start on him. If he hoped to catch them, he would have to lighten his load. Already he was close to exhaustion, and he had not been on the trail for even 24 hours yet. He halted and struggled out of his chest pack. It contained a variety of whale blubber, salt mutton and venison, and dried fish. Nancy managed to eat the whale blubber, although she wouldn't touch the salted meat. Alan was able to squeeze several slabs of frozen dried fish beneath the straps of his backpack. The rest of the fish he gave to Nancy, and she swiftly gobbled them down. He hated to leave the salted meat behind, but it was more important to overtake the hunting party ahead of him. If he missed the band of hunters, he might starve to death before he found anyone else in those thinly peopled regions. Alan got to his feet and, his load now much lighter, set out with a firm determination not to stop again until he caught up with the hunters. Lay on, Macduff, he cried to Nancy, and the two white figures, man and beast, made their slow way across the jumbled plains of ice. The hours passed. Several times Alan was sure that he spotted land ahead, only to have the high white bluffs melt away into the mist when he drew closer. Once he thought he heard dogs barking, but Nancy paid no attention to the sounds, and he decided reluctantly that he was hearing things. Several times he was forced to stop and rest, and once he fell asleep curled up on the ice. But Nancy soon got restless and woke him up with her whimpering and moaning. Painfully, Alan got to his feet, picked up the sled tracks, and staggered on. Once again the daylight came, a wintry sun that surprisingly made it even harder to pick out the tracks. The low, slanting rays, coming from behind Alan, bounced off the ice ahead of him and reflected back into his eyes. Worried about snow blindness, Alan took shelter for an hour or so and rested up rather than face into that continual glare. Almost 48 hours after he left the Ann Forbes, he came to a particularly rough belt of broken ice where huge boulders, some of them 20 feet high, had been piled on top of each other. It was tough picking his way between them, but he had the consolation of knowing it was even harder for the hunters with their loaded sled. It took an hour to work through the rough ice before he had fairly smooth ice once more stretching ahead of him, with the twin score marks of the sled runners plainly to be seen. Although the smooth ice was easier to travel over, it meant that the hunters, aided by the eager dogs, were probably pulling ahead of him, widening the distance between the two parties. So he was not unhappy when he ran across another range of ice hills, even higher than the last girdle of broken ice. He halted for a moment to survey the ice bluffs ahead of him. He staggered forward another fifty yards, then stopped again. The tops of the ice bluffs were black, swept bare of any snow by the wind. He was looking at the rounded top of a low granite cliff, Alan staggered ahead and crawled and clawed his way to the top of the bluff, 
He took the mitten off his right hand and patted and felt the actual rock with his bare fingers to make sure he was really on dry land. Then he knelt down and said a prayer of thanksgiving. He was free of the sea at last. 